a piece of parchment written by a medieval scribe. An agreement written in a long dead language between two warring parties. 800 years ago, on a reedy stretch of riverbank in southern England, the most important bargain in the history of the human race was struck. It is a legendary document of near mystical significance, with the power to change lives and shape human events. They call it simply Magna Carta. Magna Carta is the greatest document in world history. Generation after generation, we have paid in blood for the freedoms that were first won in Magna Carta. Magna Carta provided a language to legitimize freedom of occupations, freedom of property rights, the ability of individuals to use their property freely and to use their own skills freely in ways that they hadn't been able to before. This is the story of a piece of paper and the freedoms it brought. Freedoms which many believe are once more in danger. New York, December 2007. Sotheby's auction house. A single piece of parchment is up for sale. It's badly weathered and stained. Few people can read or understand it. How much is this strange piece of paper worth? On the telephone, on my left, fair warning at $19 million. Word for word, this is the most expensive document in the world, the most valuable piece of paper in human history. It's the most important document in world history. The story of Magna Carta starts long ago, in the age of Robin Hood. England, 1200 AD. Through the Greenwood, a legendary freedom fighter is on the move. The legend of Robin Hood dates back to the time of Magna Carta, and it's a conflict between the uh, aristocratic ruling classes uh, and free English people. Robin Hood represents an entire class of those who feel that they are oppressed by tyrannical lords. He's someone resisting an oppressive royal official, a sheriff, a sheriff of Nottingham, who is taking his money, taking the money from the local community. For more than a century, the English have been ruled from abroad by the French. It was a nightmare which started when William the Conqueror crushed the Anglo-Saxons at the Battle of Hastings. William the Conqueror was a ruthless military leader. William the Bastard, as, as he was sometimes called. This was a real massacre. It was a slaughter at Hastings. It was a massive land grab by an aggressive foreign dictator. William imposes the French system of government, feudalism. The king is absolute ruler. Every single acre of English land now belongs to him. William was a tyrant. There is no doubt that he was a bastard both in reality as well as in name. If you want to understand William the Conqueror, if you want to understand the power of the Normans, just look at the Tower of London. It's not to protect London, it's to control it. It's to keep those ghastly citizens in place and make sure he has the power to take their money. To tax the people, he must spy on the people. To this end, William commissions his famous Doomsday Book. The Doomsday Book was a list of all of the people in the kingdom and everything they own. He sent out a survey to chart all of the land right down to a single pig. It's a way in which the king can see the liability of the land to taxation, and then, if necessary, can jack that tax up. 
The unfree English are defenceless against the greed of the all-powerful Norman French crown. England is described by contemporary chroniclers as a cow which is being milked to sustain the continental possessions of the dynasty. By the time of Robin Hood, the English are fed up with the ruthless exploitation. But there's worse to come when, in 1199, Richard the Lionheart is succeeded by his brother, King John. John is essentially a French king. For a French-speaking king, England is really a place that you go to hunt and gather tax. And then they go off and they do what they really want to do, which is live and make war and make love in France. While John lives like a king in France, back in England, Robin Hood is fighting his agents, the sheriffs. Robin Hood's chief opponent is a man named the Sheriff of Nottingham. In King John's reign, there was an evil Sheriff of Nottingham, Philip Mark, who was accused of robbery and suspected of being a thief. He was a thoroughly unpleasant individual. It's no coincidence, then, that Robin Hood goes back to this period, because what is he doing? He's struggling, above all, against the sheriff. In 1204, King John is defeated in battle and loses his precious domains in France. the first time in the post-conquest history of England, the King of England actually has to live in England. Now, that's awful for the King. He doesn't want to spend his time in England. It's a cold, rainy place. It's also awful for the English. The outlaw Robin Hood secures his place in legend as a popular hero. The sheriffs are detestable, King John despicable great historian has described King John as a shit. And there's an awful lot of truth in that. I mean, the first thing is King John was a murderer. He had murdered his nephew, Arthur, and he starved to death the most famous woman of the age, Matilda de Breos, in the vaults of Corfe Castle. The reality is far more monstrous even than this monster that's presented by the chroniclers. He is probably the worst king in English history. Worse still, to regain his French territories, John needs to build a war chest. The only place he's going to get the money is from the English. King John was a tremendously successful king when it came to raising money. Under his rule, England was placed under really a whole new level of financial burden. He was so successful at raising money that his revenues actually quadrupled during his reign. By the end of the reign of Richard the Lionheart in 1199, chroniclers were already moaning and moaning about the very high levels of taxation. Well, if the pips squeaked under Richard, under King John, they screamed. <laughs> John sets out to fill his coffers with taxes. There seems no limit to the amount he demands. Lords are expected to provide men at arms and perform military service. If they can't, they're taxed. If a knight dies, his widow is taxed. If the widow dies, the orphans are taxed. Everything you do and don't do is taxed. Everything you own is taxed. Everything you earn or inherit or bequeath if you are arrested, you pay tax. People are arrested on trumped-up charges just to extract more tax from them. And in a case brought before law, who pays most wins the case. What John says is, if you want justice, I want money. You've got to pay for, quotes, justice. This is a kleptocracy. It's not a democracy. This is a place where the king and the king's own desires and the king's own needs rule. And if the king needs money, he will get money. King John's cruel exactions work. His barons hate him with a passion, but his coffers are swollen with their gold. 
By 1214, King John has amassed a vast fortune running to over a hundred thousand pounds. He's got more money, more cash than any king in English history before him. He stakes it all on one outcome. The biggest expedition against the King of France that's ever been launched. And it is a total catastrophe from the word go. At the Battle of Bouvines, King John and his allies are soundly and devastatingly thrashed. All of this money that he staked on his one turn of the roulette wheel, it's all gone. After that, John is finished. Uh, he has to conclude a truce. He comes back to England, and, of course, he's a sitting duck for his enemies. All the people who've been taxed to pay for this great campaign of reconquest, well, what are they going to do? Are they now going to be asked for all of this money all over again, or are they going to rebel against the king and actually sort out this regime? And it's at that point that his enemies in England say, right, we're going to get him. Now the Baron's Rebellion begins. It is a tax revolt that will change history. The Barons gather their knights and ride on the capital to appeal to the Londoners. No rebellion in England succeeds without the support of London. The Londoners threw in their lot with the Barons, and it's really that that forced the king to his knees, that forced the king into negotiation. King John is at Windsor Castle, a day's ride from London. He agrees to listen to the rebel barons. They meet halfway by the River Thames in a meadow known as Runnymede. The barons arrived and posted their tents. The king arrived with his forces. All the great figures were there. They're named in the preamble to Magna Carta. On June the 15th, 1215, King John reluctantly agrees to the Baron's demands. No free man shall be taken or imprisoned or in any way destroyed unless by the verdict of his peers or the law of the land. Magna Carta, the Great Charter, is born. The word Runnymede has gone down the ages in English history. It means a place where liberty was established. Think of the Kipling poem, What Say the Reeds of Runnymede? They whisper of liberty. They whisper that kings must obey the law. The Runnymede Magna Carta is the most valuable single page of writing in the world. Here at Salisbury Cathedral is one of the best preserved copies. Emily Nash is cathedral archivist at Salisbury and knows all about how her most precious charge was made. The scribe would have used a goose or swan feather if he was left-handed, he would have used the feather from the right wing of the swan. If he was right-handed, the feather from the left wing, because they're both differently angled at the tip. On a single piece of sheepskin parchment, a scribe has squeezed all the painstaking detail of the agreement. The basic ink recipe consisted of these, which are oak apples, These would be ground down, mixed with iron salts and gum arabic. Magna Carta is three and a half thousand words long. It's written in Latin and heavily abbreviated. They'd indicate that a word was abbreviated by putting a little dash or a line above the word. And Magna Carta is actually sprinkled with these little dashes on the whole document. The idea is to save space. You don't write out a word like omnibus in full, to all. You just write omnib. 
You don't even write the king's name in full, Johannes, you write the letter J. Originally, the Magna Carta would have had King John's great seal attached at the bottom. And we can see where this would have been. There's a jagged mark at the base, which is where someone at some point has torn the seal off. It's a great myth that John signed Magna Carta, and one can never get away from this awful howler. Uh, John probably couldn't write at all. I think he could read, but he would never have had occasion to write. Of course, all royal documents in this period are sealed, and Magna Carta was sealed. This is an exact replica of King John's seal, and the monarch's seal was always double-sided. And on one side, you'd have the monarch, or King John, sitting on the throne, illustrating him dispensing justice as a monarch, as a fair and just ruler. And on the other side is John sitting on his horse, brandishing a sword, demonstrating his military prowess and as, as a leader of men. But unfortunately, both these aspects of John he wasn't very good at. We're talking here about a membrane of sheepskin that weighs a few ounces, that's made out of sheep and goose quill and dust and oak apples. And yet this thing has rung down the centuries as the guarantee of many things that people believe are essential to their well-being, to society in general, and to the rule of law. It's the most important document in world history. Magna Carta demanded justice and liberty. No man shall be seized or imprisoned except by the lawful judgment of his equals. It's the one which people rely on when we talk about our rights as citizens. There was no trial by jury then, but it eventually evolved into trial by jury and due process, which is of course a crucial element in our constitutional arrangements. To no one will we sell, to no one deny or delay right or justice. Those general principles ring down the ages. The idea that the king himself, that the state, must obey the law. But the main complaint of the barons and the Londoners was not unlawful arrest. The Londoners were demanding their freedom from royal regulation. Several key clauses in Magna Carta concern the freedom to trade and the rights of merchants. All merchants may enter or leave England unharmed and without fear for purposes of trade, free from all illegal exactions. Right, two pound each or four for seven. The city of London shall enjoy all its ancient liberties, both by land and by water. London was crucial to the revolt. They wanted Magna Carta to reflect their interests, which was trade. The freedom of movement of people and the freedom of goods and services, which is so crucial to the way the world operates today, comes out of a simple clause like that. Magna Carta is a very pragmatic document, in that sense a very British document. It's not all about theory. But most of the demands of Magna Carta reflect the biggest concern of barons and Londoners alike. King John must recognize that the possessions of others are private property. They're not his to take at will. But one Magna Carta clause about tax in particular will go on to shake the world. No taxation may be levied in our kingdom without its general consent. That actually is one of the most important clauses in the Great Charter itself and it provides that there shall be no scootage or tallage, which is taxation, without the consent of the Council of the Realm. And that was shortly to become Parliament. That is the great lever, the source of all Parliament's power down the centuries, namely its control over taxation. The point of Magna Carta is that taxpayers decide how much of their money is going to be taken from them and what it's going to be spent on. This is the historical origin of the English Parliament, the mother of parliaments, whose job it was to defend taxpayers from the greedy, tax-consuming king. At the time of Magna Carta, the Common Council meant barons and bishops, and even today, they have a role. I sit in the House of Lords, uh, and that means I'm a lord. I'm like the barons, if you like, who have signed Magna Carta. The House of Lords is the Parliament. It's, it's a talking shop, if you like. That's where the word comes from in, in Norman French. 
Now, it has very little power these days, but it's descended directly from the negotiation with the king over Magna Carta, uh, which was all about making clear that the king, like every other citizen in the land, was subject to the rule of law, uh, and that any decision he took, particularly with respect to raising taxes and things, had to be approved by a committee representing the people. It's not just political freedom or legal freedom that matters. What matters is economic freedom. To the barons and the Londoners, if there is no private property, if their belongings can simply be taken from them, they are not in any meaningful way free people. The protection of private property is an essential part of freedom. In the summer of 1215, it looks like the barons get what they want. But King John has no intention of keeping his word. I will never grant them liberties which will make me a slave. Never. He writes to the Pope and has the charter annulled. Within four months of the peace talks at Runnymede, England is plunged into civil war. That would have been the end of it, but then the next year King John died. Uh, one chronicler said that he died of a surfeit of peaches and new cider. Whatever it was, it was bad for King John, he died. Matthew Paris, the chronicler of St. Albans, says that hell is a very foul place. Foul as is hell, he says, it is made fouler for the presence there of King John. John's son and heir, Henry III, is just nine years old. Boys of nine years old did not run the country in medieval times. They were killed. They happened to have accidents. William Marshall, the finest knight in England, is appointed as Henry's guardian and regent. William Marshall is the great hero of this event. He was a nobody from nothing. William Marshall is the David Beckham of the 13th century. He's a man who really made his reputation as a sportsman on the tournament fields. To end the war and keep Henry alive, Marshall comes up with a cunning plan. William Marshall, who today we would call a public relations idea, he said, let's have Henry III reissue Magna Carta. It's a lucky break for liberty. William Marshall is buried in London, here in Temple Church, spiritual home of the Knights Templar, guardians, according to legend, of the Holy Grail. Thanks to him, Magna Carta survives. And yet, back in the 13th century, Magna Carta barely touches the lives of the great mass of common folk. For the unfree peasants of feudal England, the Magna Carta liberties do not apply. It was about the barons. It was about free men, with an emphasis on both free and men. So it was not all English folk. The majority of the population, say 80% are peasants. They are bonded to the land. They have none of those liberties. At the bottom of the feudal hierarchy are the unfree peasants, known as serfs. They can only dream of freedom and property rights. The villagers in the countryside were subject to something called serfdom, which meant that they were essentially owned by their landlord. The serfs didn't own property. They were people's property. They were the property of the lords. Fancy a holiday? Forget it. If you're the child of a serf, then you're a serf too. Forced to live and work on your lord's land, you're staying put. Your children can be sold by the Lord. He also has the right to choose a husband for your daughter. When she marries, you pay a tax to the Lord. And if no one will marry her, you have to pay another tax to the Lord. Property? Not likely. What you grow, what you make, all belong to your Lord. The Lords are mini King Johns. If I woke up tomorrow morning as a serf in the early 13th century, I would resign. I would say, no, no more of this. I'm going to go to the town. 
But if young Deirdre McCluskey ran off to a town in the 13th century, she'd be in for a disappointment. If you lived in a medieval town, you could not follow a trade, you could not go into business, you could not do anything, in fact, in a way of making a living, unless you belonged to a guild. It was in the interest of the guild to limit the number of practitioners of a particular occupation. So you couldn't just set up in business as a weaver or as a fishmonger. You had to gain admission to the guild. Guilds decided how many people they would admit into the trade and that you would have to pay to be admitted into the trade. You'd have to do a long apprenticeship. You couldn't move to another town because there'd be another guild there um, who would stop you coming in. It was the guilds who perpetuated the class system and made sure that the trade of the towns was not going to be opened up to anybody from the countryside. Unfree serfs were not allowed into the guilds, but neither were guild members free to act as they liked. Hundreds of guild regulations are enforced by the guild master. To prevent competition, he tells you what tools you are allowed to use, how much to produce and what price to charge. He tells you how many apprentices you can take and what hours you're allowed to work. He tells you exactly what kind of products you can make and how they should be made. He doesn't want anyone introducing fancy innovations that could threaten the livelihoods of other guild members. And for the right to belong to a guild, you have to pay your dues. The guild master then passes this on to the local lord, who has granted the monopoly license to the guild in the first place. They would actually make gifts of money. They called them honoraria in their account books, but basically they were bribes, to get legislation passed that would enable them to rip off customers. So these were real barriers against free trade in England. This is where Magna Carta starts to work its magic. Over the course of the 13th century, the charter is reissued by every successive king. And each time, more copies of the charter are made and sent out. Medieval copies of Magna Carta are now incredibly rare. Here at the Royal Society of Antiquaries in London, only three remain. One is the Liber Niger, the Black Book of Peterborough. It is a copy of the original 1215 Magna Carta as issued by King John. Rarer still is this, the Hales Owen Abbey scroll. It's a copy of the 1225 Magna Carta as issued by John's son, King Henry III. We're very lucky that the Middle Ages used sheepskin because if they'd found paper a few hundred years before, all of this would have gone. Today, this priceless copy of Magna Carta is protected in a guarded, sealed vault. But when it was produced, this incendiary document was meant for public display. There were various councils that insisted that a copy of Magna Carta be nailed up to the door of every church in England. This isn't just some sort of ephemeral thing that you can get rid of. This is the, the law of England, and you're jolly well going to make sure that it's visible. By the end of the 13th century, Magna Carta is being translated from Latin into common English. Now everyone can understand what it says. Magna Carta becomes known, available and exploited by wider and wider sections of society. By 1300, it is being proclaimed in English, which is the language of the great bulk of the population. So the Charter is broadening out, it's widening in scope, it's spreading wings, and it's flying through the whole political community. The Great Peasants' Revolt is one of the most famous rebellions in history. In 1382, the commoners of England rise up and demand their freedom. But it starts when they simply refuse to pay their taxes. Peasants' revolt is, as much as anything, a tax revolt, uh, and they call on Magna Carta. The peasants are waving Magna Carta in the face of the barons and saying, if it's good enough for you, 
it's good enough for us. The cat was out of the bag. Everybody wanted a bit of the freedoms that Magna Carta enshrined. Like the barons before them, the peasants, led by Watt Tyler, march on London. This is the way the peasants' revolt rebels would have came. And they would have crossed this bridge because for over 500 years, London Bridge was the only bridge in and out of the city. The tower was stormed. Several of the king's high-ranking friends and dignitaries were dragged out of the tower and publicly executed. The peasants are joined by rebellious Londoners. They release prisoners from jail. They loot and burn official buildings and execute nobles. The king, accompanied by the Lord Mayor of London, Sir William Walworth, agrees to meet the rebel leader, Watt Tyler. It all got a little bit scary and hairy. The mob moved towards the king. William Walworth took his dagger and stabbed Watt Tyler to death. The king finally calms the mob with promises. Magna Carta freedoms for the common man. But when the rebels disperse, they are hunted down, tortured and executed. The Peasants' Revolt does change the world, even though it comes to a sticky end. The Peasants' Revolt has been put down, its leaders killed. And yet a great victory has been won, for Magna Carta has now become a mighty weapon in the hands of the people. Magna Carta wasn't designed to bring down feudalism, but uh, the principles that, that it contained did bring down feudalism in the long run. It had an effect far beyond what its authors had in mind. I think the barons would have been appalled if they'd known what, what was happening, because barons are, are not Democrats. In the end, it is not a political movement that freed the common people of England. They simply break the law, ignoring guild restrictions. In a system known as putting out, middlemen went from cottage to cottage, dropping off raw materials and picking up finished products to sell illicitly in unregulated markets. Rural cottage industry succeeded because it could produce things cheaper and better than the lazy, corrupt town guilds. You get this huge growth of rural cottage industries, ordinary people, women, children, setting up textile industries, little metal trades growing up in various parts of the English countryside. Peasants who make money can pay rent. Greedy lords turn a blind eye. It is trade, not politics, that frees the peasants. By the time of the Tudors, England has transformed into a land of entrepreneurial wheeler dealers. The Tudor era was built on free trade, and with that came enormous prosperity. Suddenly, the lower orders could aspire to be members of a trade. The guilds were losing their stranglehold. To sell the goods illicitly produced in the countryside, illicit black markets started to spring up outside town boundaries, beyond the control of town guilds. These areas were known as liberties. Liberties were little enclaves where the regulations that prevailed in the surrounding city did not apply. And within those liberties, it was actually possible to practice crafts without being members of a guild. In the liberties, anyone can follow a craft or trade. Here you can buy cut price black market candles, black market salt, pots, fish, cloth, and hundreds of other basic goods. And not just ordinary goods are available here. Exotic foreign imports sneak through. It is really a kind of black market activity. On the one hand, you could see a highly regulated, cartelized society, people who were already at the top of the tree running things to suit themselves, and right next door, outside it, an unregulated society and economy, uh, which was economically much more dynamic, much more innovative, uh, and ultimately much more successful. One of the most famous liberties in London lay south of the Thames, and it still exists today. This is Borough Market. 
There's been a working market on this site since the early 1200s. And it would have been known to the likes of William Shakespeare, Geoffrey Chaucer, Samuel Pepys, Charles Dickens, would all have known this market. It's much more liberal thinking than we had over in the city of London, which is why there were so many inns, taverns and theatres around this area. In the unregulated liberties, you were free to buy and sell. You were also free to think and to speak. North of the Thames, there was censorship. In the liberties, you could say what you liked. The theatres of the Tudor period are all to be found in liberties. Shakespeare's Globe was here in Borough Market. The common folk were free to make money and to enjoy it. It wasn't just material prosperity, it was a wonderful cultural golden age. It was an age in which rising wealth meant that people could do things that they hadn't even imagined in the last 500 years. If you didn't fancy a play, there were other diversions available next door. All of this land was owned once by the bishops of Winchester. They took the rents from the bear baiting pits, cockpits, the theatres, the alehouses, and even the stews. And a stew is an old English name for a brothel. So it could be said that the bishops of Winchester were actually medieval pimps. The good thing for ordinary people was that there were lots and lots of these liberties in many English towns. And they were little enclaves where the regulations that prevailed in the surrounding city did not apply. Outside the towns, in the liberties, where people are free to do their, what they want, you get an enormous burst of creative energy. And that actually produces prosperity on a grand scale. The prosperity generated by free trade leads on to something very new in Tudor times, social mobility. What you had was a lot of new men, as they were called, people who were not from the traditional aristocracy, who made fortunes in trade, in commerce, in business, and then went on to build great homes of their own in the countryside. So there were all kinds of people making their fortune. Magna Carta did have an influence over history on ordinary people, reminding them that, hang on a minute, you don't have to stay in your place in society. You can aspire to something better. Sir Francis Drake starts life as a farmer's son from Devon, but he becomes one of the richest men in England and the first Englishman to circumnavigate the globe. Francis Drake is an example of someone who came from a very humble background, became basically a, a kind of, well, it's a pirate, but it, you know, it's a freebooting free commercial person, shall we say. <laughs> Black market activity undermined the town guilds. Now the same would happen at sea. Privileged merchant guilds were meant to have a monopoly of sea trade. The English privateers, or pirates, demand the freedom to trade. Don't imagine that every pirate was a, an out-and-out -out criminal. Uh, on the contrary, uh, these, many of them were people who wanted to trade and to defend trade routes and would take on anybody that got in their way. Across the civilised world, the English commoners become notorious for their disregard of rules and regulations and disrespect for their social betters. You get constant scandalised and shocked reports by people from France or Italy about just how riotous, unruly uh, and generally socially disreputable the English are. When in the 18th century the upper-class dandy Casanova visits London, he's amazed that the lower classes have the nerve to laugh at how he's dressed. A man in court dress cannot walk the streets of London without being pelted by the mob. The history of Britain, and England in particular, is one of bullshittiness. You know, I mean, there's Magna Carta, there's the Peasants' Revolt. We've got into the habit of pulling our rulers down a peg. But the Magna Carta principles so cherished by the English are about to be tested. In 1603, the last Tudor monarch dies. Wise old Elizabeth I is succeeded by the arrogant King James of Scotland, the tyrant Stuart King. Suddenly you had a Scottish monarchy that were steeped in the values of the continent uh, and not in English values of, of freedom. The new king, James I, tries to turn back the clock. He can tax his subjects as much as he likes, he says, because he is all-powerful, appointed by God. 
Divine Right of Kings is the very opposite of Magna Carta. It's essentially saying, no, sorry, uh, God told me I'm in charge and I'm not subject to the law. You had to obey the king. I think James I said, even if he is as evil as Nero, you had to obey him and then leave it to the Almighty to sort things out. Once again, freedom is challenged. And once again, it's Magna Carta that comes to the rescue. The ancient document has already acquired an almost mystical power. Judge and parliamentarian Edward Cook leads the attack against the new tyranny. He does so by invoking Magna Carta. Sir Edward Cook is really the man. He was the one who famously said uh, in debates in Parliament, Magna Carta is such a fellow, he will have no sovereign. Inspired by Magna Carta, Cook writes a revolutionary tract, Institutes of the Laws of England. He sort of introduces it. It is called Magna Carta, not that it is great in quantity, for there be many voluminous charters longer than this is, but, I'm omitting some words, in respect of the great importance and weightiness of the matter, as hereafter shall appear. For Cook, Magna Carta wasn't just some very old piece of paper. It was a weapon that could be used in a revolutionary war. When James I dies, his son Charles takes the throne. Charles needs cash, but he wants nothing to do with the taxpayers' parliament. Instead, he raises money by selling monopoly rights. To follow a trade, you need a license from the crown, and for that, you must pay. Granting monopolies seemed a very attractive way of raising money without having to make concessions to Parliament. The monopolies granted by the monarch were a form of uh, taxation. You had to pay in order to produce perfectly ordinary, everyday things that everybody wanted to buy. Monarchs declared monopolies for every product imaginable. Bricks, windows, coal, timber, feathers, hairbrushes, soap, linen, leather, hats, belts, buttons, lobsters, salt, tobacco, books, dice, cards, lighthouses, mouse traps. To trade, you need a license, and for that, you must pay dearly. It meant that instead of a functioning free market, you had what we would now call crony capitalism. It was just like the guilds all over again. Edward Cook goes into battle to fight again for freedom. 400 years after Magna Carta was first promulgated, Edward Cook dusts it off and begins to use it to defend freedom of occupation saying that monopolies were against the freedoms of individuals and they were counter to the common law of the land, they were counter to Magna Carta, and they should not be enforced. In 1642, Parliament has had enough of the tyrannical kings. England is plunged into civil war. The prancing king and his foppish upper-class cavaliers are no match for the new model army of Oliver Cromwell. The king is captured and brought to trial in Westminster Hall. This time, the rebels aren't interested in signing a deal. The whole idea of trying a king for treason is bizarre in most of continental Europe and only works in Britain because of Magna Carta. These are the steps that King Charles I came up when he was tried for treason in the 1640s. Uh, and what lay behind that argument, that frightful crisis in English history, uh, was the fact that the English had got a whiff of freedoms in the previous century. And they'd got used to the idea that the king was subject to the law just like they were. And here they find that he's trying to be above the law, and they are furious about it. How do you actually force a king to do what you want him to do? It's the problem that the barons faced against King John. It's ex exactly the same in the 17th century. In the end, the only way you can do it is by cutting off his head. For the king to be executed, well, it was you know, very barbaric, unless you happen to think the king actually had thoroughly deserved it. The English have killed more of their kings than most other peoples in European history. What do the barons of England do? French writers ask, they kill their kings. It's something that the English become famous for. 
Victorious rebel General Oliver Cromwell assumes power as a military dictator, but the English have had enough of tyrants. In 1689, Parliament invites the Dutch Protestants William and Mary to take the English throne on one condition. It's a kind of package deal in return for being put on the throne, they had to agree to what became the English Bill of Rights, 1689. And that's clearly a successor document that takes its place alongside Magna Carta. But many Englishmen had had enough. To realize the promise of Magna Carta, they will make a new life. Gentlemen, untold riches lie before us. In 1606, three small ships set sail from England bound for the New World. There's a fantastic coincidence in the fact that the American colonies are founded around the same time that Britain is going through this convulsion and is going back to Magna Carta to insist on the king being subject to the law. The Susan Constant, the Godspeed and the Discovery boldly take Magna Carta where no charter has been before. The whole virus of freedom is in the blood when the colonists go over to America. Land ho! Land! On April the 26th, 1607, they land in Virginia. Do we hereby lay claim to the land of Virginia? These first successful English colonists establish the settlement of Jamestown. They bring with them a charter, setting out their rights and duties as Englishmen abroad. The Virginia Charter. Henceforth there will be laws here, strong laws to be upheld by all. The Virginia Charter of 1606 says the colonists, those who immigrate to Virginia, shall enjoy the privileges, franchises, and immunities that they would have enjoyed in the mother country. In other words, if you pull up roots and go to this wilderness called Virginia, you don't leave your rights behind. So you have in Virginia from the very outset, from the very first settlement, a vehicle by which Magna Carta leaves England and comes to America. To live as strangers in a strange land. Nay, to live free in a free land. Hundreds of thousands of English people in the 17th century moved to the New World, carrying in their heads the importance of Magna Carta and this myth of ancient liberties, which then grew in this new soil. It is here that the Great Charter will ignite the greatest tax revolt ever seen and change the course of world history. An Englishman thinks back to 1215, to Runnymede. He thinks of liberty, and he thinks of a tradition of liberty that I promise you, we Americans think of too. But the story of freedom is not so straightforward. Still to come, in this brave new land of the free, countless humans taken by force from their homes will be subjected to the horror and injustice of bondage. Our founding document says all men are created equal, endowed by their creator, blah, 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 blah. All men are created equal. This was written by a slave owner. And today's challenge to Magna Carta the whole point about Parliament was it was, a, it was supposed to give consent to taxation and to limit it. Uh, nowadays, Parliament is basically about how to spend it. Parliament is behaving much more like the King of 1215 than the Parliament of 1215. We're all becoming King Johns. We're trying to live at the expense of our fellow man. We've had to fight some bloody wars to get the freedoms that we've got today. These are attempts to win freedom for all of us, and we mustn't be complacent about these freedoms and sleepwalking to giving them away again.